with their feet still wet from the waters of belonging, with the scent of olives still lingering in their noses, with their backs likely still aching from their interrupted slumber in the garden. They left him there by himself. All of the disciples, every single one of them, deserted Jesus and fled. Who could blame them? Why wouldn't they flee? Why wouldn't they depart as quickly as possible from this frightening, potentially life-threatening scene? A mob had gathered. Swords and clubs were in their hand. One of their own was leading the way and betrayed Jesus with a kiss. An arrest had been made. Perhaps they were left wondering who was next? Who among them was also a betrayer? Why wouldn't they flee? In this moment, in the moment, they themselves had also been left alone, holding nothing but the memories of what used to be and the shattered dreams of what they had hoped was to come. Why wouldn't they flee? Perhaps ringing in their hearts and echoing in their minds that night was the cry of dereliction they had heard since their youth and their songs of faith. Perhaps now, it took on a new personal meaning. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my groaning, Oh my God, I, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. They deserted him and fled. Who could blame them? They had been left alone, together. Abandoned and alone wasn't the way this was supposed to be. Why wouldn't they flee? We can relate, you and I. For who among us hasn't experienced the sting of felt absence? Who hasn't suffered the feeling of being left alone? at the deepest moments of sorrow, in the throes of intense pain. Under the clouds of depression, in the uncertainty of the future, who hasn't faced that feeling? Who among us hasn't felt like abandoning all that we once held so dear, everything that used to be so certain, the simplistic answers once believed that no longer work in a complex and confusing world. The conclusions seemed to make so much sense once upon a time. Why wouldn't we flee? Moments like these are disquieting and discomforting. And in the midst of them, there always seem to be those who claim that times like these are signs of weakness, a lack of faith, 
or just simply should never happen to someone who believes rightly, someone who has it all together. And often, those voices have to offer us, in response, nothing more than saccharine platitudes and sanitary religiosity. It's as if those who offer such wisdom are only trying to convince themselves that things will always get better for the person of faith if they just faith hard enough. But in the depths of our being, we know that anything that simplistic is too good to be true. Because we have found ourselves in moments when things do not get better. There are times in our lives when there is not an end in sight. Times when we find ourselves covered in death's long shadow. Times when disease has come to visit our family. Times when there is proclamation of the abrupt end to what seemed like a never-ending beautiful love story. Oh yes, we are too familiar with times when things seem to threaten to overwhelm us. Life brings with it moments when our own cry of dereliction is the only honest thing we can utter and is our only sense of comfort. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Wherever we may find ourselves tonight, our challenge is to remember this promise. God meets us here. Smack dab in the middle of this magnificent mess in which we find ourselves. Here, in the midst of this tumultuous journey we call life. This night and the next two days remind us of the power of this truth. Tonight, my friends, the Christ candle will go out and the weight of the resulting darkness will be felt in the core of who we are. But the God of the outcast who welcomes the untouchables, who dines with the forgotten, forsaken, and marginalized, who kneels at the disciples' feet, who receives the betrayer's kiss, and yet calls him friend, the God of the bent knee, the God of the blood-stained brow, the God of tomorrow's cross, has experienced the anguish of abandonment and is present here in the felt absence. On this night, when we have desertion and abandonment on our minds, perhaps what we must consider leaving behind is the notion of a distant, unconcerned, unattached, and unmoved God. That God has never existed. Tonight, we are invited to let go. To let go of the notion of a God who refuses to accompany us even to the very gates of hell. To let go of the notion of a God who is too small to hear, to bear our cries of anger and anguish. To let go of the notion of a God who only honors the prayers of the perfectly put together. Yes, it is these next three days that will tell us the story of a different God. The God of this table of broken body, of shed blood. The God present in the garden of despair, the God of the cross, will not leave us orphaned and will not leave us abandoned. 
and will not only accompany us to the doorway of death and absence, but will go there before us, meet us there, and linger there with us. Tonight, it is going to get dark. Let us dwell there together. God is present there in the darkness, in our sorrow, in our pain, in our disease, in our separation. Yes, indeed, in our feelings of abandonment. The God who became flesh is there. God is here. For in life and in death and in all of the moments in between, we belong to God. Amen.